The reading is from Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 17, and is printed on your service sheet. (coughs) Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now, at last by God's will, the way may be opened for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Our dear Lord, we thank you that we can gather this morning in freedom and come direct into your most glorious presence through your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, this morning we're not here to think of one particular man, one particular human being. We're here to think of you and your grace and your kindness and faithfulness to your people and to a needy world. And we pray, Lord, that as a result of this morning, we ourselves will have our hearts stirred to worship you more gloriously and more fervently and to serve you more faithfully. And Lord, to be astounded at your wonderful, amazing grace. Amen. Well, do please uh, be seated. Well, it all began on the 31st of October, 1517, All Hallows' Eve. And it began with the posting of a legitimate university notice on the local university notice board, which happened to be the door of the church in the castle of Wittenberg, now modern-day Germany. Now, this in itself was nothing unusual. It was the 16th century equivalent to blogging. Uh, you know, to invite a sort of conversation, a discussion. Now, what did the notice consist of? Well, it was a series of theological propositions for debate called 95 Statements or Theses. And these were mainly protesting against the Roman Catholic Church's practice of indulgences. So let me explain. The Castle of Wittenberg was renowned for its collection of religious artifacts called relics, 5,005 in total. Amongst them, it was alleged, were pieces from the burning bush of Moses, nine thorns from the crown of Christ, 35 fragments of the cross of Christ, hay and straw from the stable in the nativity, some hair of the Virgin Mary, as well as 204 pieces of bodies of babies King Herod uh, slaughtered, including one body 
fully intact. Now, it was claimed that by adoring these items together with reciting certain prayers and paying the appropriate fee, it was possible to get remission either later for yourself or at, pre at present a dead relative who found themselves in a place between heaven and hell called purgatory. And this was an unpleasant abode of purification for those who had not yet quite made it. This remission was called an indulgence. And this could only be granted by the Pope. Now, as you will appreciate, such a belief had a powerful hold on the lives of many ordinary worshippers, as well as providing a lucrative income for the church. And one person who managed to rake an awful lot of money in by teaching this was a man called Tetzel. And he traveled around Europe promoting the idea which seemed to offer some hope beyond the grave. And he even managed to devise a little ditty, what today would be thought of as a sales slogan. The dead cry, pity us, pity us. We are in dire torment from which you can redeem us for a mere pittance. Will you leave us here in the flames? Will you delay our promise? glory. As soon as a coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Now, obviously, if you believed that it was your mother or your child in such a place, then that would be a powerful motivator for you to give, wouldn't it? Now, the terror of purgatory was sometimes portrayed to the common folk by means of players. And it was this, amongst other things, that was about to be challenged on that All Hallows' Eve. Who was it that dared to make such a protest against the might of the establishment? Well, it was a young professor of theology from the local university, an Augustinian monk by the name of Martin Luther. In fact, his real name was Martin Luder, he changed his name to a Latinized version, Lutharius, which was the trendy thing to do in those days. And that meant liberator, Martin the liberator. So he obviously had a high view of himself even then. But then he shortened it to Luther. So what was it that he began? Nothing less than the great spiritual revolution called the Magisterial Reformation. So you've got to ask, what was Martin Luther's problem which led him to take such drastic action, putting his own life at risk? Was it simply a concern with the ruthless exploitation of the religiously gullible? A voice raised against ecclesiastical corruption? Not really. There were many other people at the time who were very unhappy with the state of the church in Europe. Now, you see, for Luther, it was something much, much deeper, something more personal. This is the way Professor Roland Bainton of Yale University describes what was happening. Martin Luther did not rebel because he was a German, nor did he rebel because he was a sectarian. Luther was obsessed with the problem of his own personal salvation. He became a rebel only because he found the church's way of salvation to be in vain. In fact, this is how Luther described his own struggle and his one great question. How can I find a gracious God? That is, how can a righteous God, he says, ever enter into a personal relationship with sinners. Now that was, as he saw it, the fundamental problem facing everybody. And I would suggest to you that as we look into our own hearts and see things there we would prefer not to see, that could be a question going through our minds this morning. How on earth could God possibly accept someone like me and not simply banish me into eternity. 
So Bentham was quite correct. Luther was obsessed. But it was not the obsession of a neurotically diseased mind. It was the anguish of a healthy conscience. He knew he was on the wrong side of God, a holy God. And that if this were not rectified somehow, then his eternal future looked very bleak indeed. But of course, the church had already made answer to his dilemma, as taught by one of its leading theologians, Gabriel Beale, which went something along these lines. That God had entered into a contract with humanity called a covenant. If human beings kept their side of the contract, doing things like loving God, hating sin, then God would keep his side of the bargain by putting them in a right with himself, justifying them. And God was quite impartial about this. It was what you did rather than who you were that mattered. But it was recognized that help was needed to keep our side of the covenant, and that help came in the form of something called grace. Now the question is, how was this grace to be received? The answer, according to the church, was through the church's sacramental plumbing system, which piped grace like a fluid to the individual. Now, the church taught that there were seven sacraments which acted as conduits of mercy to the soul. There's baptism, confirmation, confession and penance, the mass, marriage, ordination, and the last rites. And this is still taught at the popular level. And to demonstrate this, let me read to you just a small part of a little booklet written by Father Francis Ripley, which is an introduction to the Roman Catholic faith. The redemption of the human race came through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Christ substituted himself for us by taking our punishment on himself. So far, so good. Luther and all the reformers would have agreed with that. But then we come to a, a little addition which makes all the difference in the world. God has appointed certain definite channels by which the merits of Christ's death are applied to ourselves. Those channels are called sacraments. Now Luther, of course, had tried all of these to find peace with God. But at every turn, all he encountered was total despair. Born in 1483 to a coal miner, he was baptized as a baby, confirmed as a child, regularly attended Mass and Confession, the first four sacraments. But when he just finished his Master's in law at the age of 22, something happened to him on the 30th of June, 1505, which was to change his life forever. He was out riding when a severe thunderstorm struck and a bolt of lightning struck the ground beside him, causing his horse to throw him to the ground. And taking this as a sign of the judgment which was to come, he cried out, Saint Anne, help me, and I will become a monk. Now, he probably prayed to Saint Anne because Saint Anne was the patron saint of miners. Well, true to his word, that is exactly what he did. He got ordained Sacrament 6. And having taken a vow of celibacy, Sacrament 5, of course, was ruled out. And that left only the last rites, number 7. And yet, the internal struggle not only continued, it intensified. This is how Luther described his own experience. I was a good monk and kept my orders so strictly that I could say that if ever a monk could get to heaven through monastic discipline, I was that monk. All my companions in the monastery would confirm this. 
And yet my conscience would not give me certainty, but always doubted and said, you didn't do that right. You weren't contrite enough. Oh, you left that out of your confession. The more I tried to remedy an uncertain, weak, and troubled conscience with human traditions, I daily found it more uncertain, weak, and more troubled. You see, Luther couldn't meet the preconditions for mercy as the church taught it. Oh, he tried. How he tried. He prayed until he was sick. He fasted until his body was emaciated. He even joined other pilgrims to go to Rome, climbing the sacred stairs of St. Peter on his hands and knees, kissing each step along the way. After all, had the church not taught that release from purgatory could be obtained by showing that kind of devotion. But when he got to the top of the stairs, to his horror, all he was met with was the most appalling doubt. And so he went back to his monastery feeling worse than ever. His father, Superior, a, superior, a man named Stalpitz, exasperated with him and all his morbid doubts, sent him away to the University of Wittenberg to study for a doctorate in the hope that this would take his mind off things. What subject should I study, he asked his father superior. And the wise old friar replied, biblical studies. And that's what he did. And that is when the internal spiritual revolution, which began in his own life, was eventually to spill out into the whole of Europe. And it happened like this. In his little study, before him, in the original Greek, he had Paul's letter to the Romans, the very passage that Shirley read out to us a few moments ago. The thing was, he couldn't make it past Romans chapter 1 and verses 16 to 17, which reads, For I am not ashamed of the you angelion, that is the good news. For it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. For in the good news, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Now, Luther had been brought up with the belief that God's righteousness demanded the blotting out of sinners like himself in judgment. That's what a righteous God will do. So how could that be good news? It sounded like bad news to him and everybody else. And then slowly the, the light began to dawn on what Paul actually meant. The righteousness of God of which the gospel speaks is not earned, it's a gift. Instead of becoming righteous by being good, being religious, we are declared righteous or justified, pronounced to be in the right with God, by God himself. And this is possible not because of anything we have done, but because of everything that God's son Jesus has done. We're not put in a restored relationship with God and kept there by what he does in us through the sacramental plumbing system, but because of what God has done for us by the way of the sinless life and the atoning death of Jesus. So it was at the cross, you see, that God showed his righteousness, not by ignoring sin, but by punishing it in Jesus in our place. So going back to Luther's earlier experience, the cross is, if you like, God's lightning conductor, drawing his anger away from us onto his son. So as Paul says in Romans chapter 5, Christ died for the ungodly. The judgment we deserve, Jesus freely receives. And he gives us 
what we don't deserve, eternal life. And Luther saw this as the great exchange. What we don't deserve, Jesus has. What, what, we, what he doesn't deserve, he takes upon himself. And what we don't deserve, he gives to us his forgiveness. So we may want to think of it in terms of having the right clothes to enter into the presence of a monarch. In fact, this is a parable Jesus himself uses. Because of our rebellion and our selfishness in God's sight, it appears that we're wearing sort of sweat-laden, flea-infested vests. They're filthy, they stink. And you would never dream of going to the palace dressed like that. No, you need a change of clothes. The question is, where do you get them? Well, from Jesus Christ, God's perfect son. He'd lived the perfect life we could not live on our behalf, a righteous life in every respect. And so as we personally come to him, he, as it were, takes on his back our dirty linen and he incinerates them on the cross. And in exchange, he puts upon us his pure, fresh clothes of righteousness. So that now as God looks upon us, he sees us through the lens of his son, the filter of Jesus Christ. And God shows his righteousness in two senses. First, he is righteous in judging sin, but he judges sin at the cross. He doesn't ignore it. And second, he is righteous in rescuing us, doing that which we cannot do for ourselves. And that link between God saving and so demonstrating his righteousness in this sense is found in Isaiah chapter 51, verse 5, where God says, My righteousness draws near speedily. My salvation is on the way. So you see, God acting righteousness, righteously in saving. The two are more or less interchangeable. But then you've got to ask, well, how do we receive this? How does this righteousness come to us? Well, certainly not through the sacraments. Paul didn't even mention them. But what he does speak of is faith. Now, the word faith is often banded around today as it was in the days of Luther, as if we all mean the same thing, when in fact we don't. If ever there was a misunderstood word today, both inside and outside the Christian circles, it's that little word, faith. And part of the problem is that people see faith as, as something distinctly religious. So the religious person has faith, whereas the non-religious person doesn't. Faith is uncertain, uh, begins when, when, when certainty ends, when reason comes to an end. But that's a great pity, because the Bible's use of the word faith is, is, is not particularly religious. It's a word which is very common, referring to what everyone does, everywhere, all the time, namely trusting. We all trust certain things to be true, and certain people to be dependable. So having faith in that sense is universal. Everybody does it. But having saving faith isn't. You see, it's the object of this saving faith which makes it saving. That's the effect. And it has three elements. I mean, if any one of these three is missing, then you don't have Christian faith. First, faith consists of facts, knowing certain things to be true. Now, this is the case with the Christian message. It has factual content. It concerns Jesus Christ, a historical figure who is Lord, the same uh, Lord, the same God as in the Old Testament, Yahweh, Lord. And this God-man Jesus was raised from the dead, which means he died. And what is more, this was a special death as it was a sacrifice for sins to turn away God's anger and make him favorable towards us. The technical word is propitiation. Now, either those things are true or they're not true. 
The second part of faith is assent. That is, we say we believe these things to be so. So we're not talking about these things just being true for some people. But really, these things are true for all people, but especially for those of us who are believers. But it's possible, you know, to have both of those things in relation to Jesus Christ, and that will not make you a Christian. And it will not make you a Christian for this very simple reason, that all the demons in hell believe those two things, and they're not Christians. The Apostle James says, show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there's one God? Good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. Now, it is both sad and dangerous when people put themselves in the same position as the demons. Oh, yes, they believe Jesus existed. Oh, yes, they believe he died on a cross. And even when pushed with all the evidence, they may even be willing to say, yeah, I believe he rose from the dead. And yet, it makes no perceivable difference to their lives because of the absence of the third element, personal trust. And Paul describes that vital element later on in Romans in chapter 10. He says, it is believing in your heart. It is with your heart you believe and so are justified. This is how Luther describes his own experience of this. And when he came to understand what Romans 1.16 really means, he, he says, I felt as if I'd been reborn and gone through the open doors of paradise. The whole of Scripture took on a new meaning, and whereas I formerly hated the expression, the righteousness of God, I now began to regard it as an inexpressibly sweet truth, a gate into heaven. Isn't that wonderful? Instead of God being this dark, brooding figure forever disapproving of him, Luther, through the gospel, discovered him to be a kind father who gave his one and only son to save people like him. And so Luther worked through the consequences. If this were true, then religious rigmarole in which he had been brought up was false and misleading. Instead of people enjoying the liberty of forgiveness of sins through faith, they were being held captive in fear and superstition. Hence his rebellion against the sale of indulgences. They have no place in God's scheme of salvation. Now you can imagine this was not that well received by some people. For a start, it was a direct challenge to the authority of the church. It seriously threatened its revenue. And so Luther was called to give an account before the Holy Emperor himself in 1521. He was then excommunicated by the Pope, and attempts were made upon his life such that at one point he was kidnapped by his friends and hidden away for his own safety. That's when he grew his hair long and his beard and became known as St. George. But you see, now his spirit was free, as was his mind. And his teaching began to spread throughout Europe like wildfire. Even books were arriving in Cambridge. And eventually when they found them, the authorities burned them. But through it, you see, through the printing presses, Europe was being transformed. And his own personal life was being changed too. His guide now was the Bible. This was the scripture alone idea that the Magisterial authority is with Scripture. What the Bible says, God says. And since the Bible did not forbid marriage, he got married to a runaway nun, Catherine von Bora. And he referred to her as my Lord Katie, so you know who wore the trousers in that family. Well, and got him married, they were given a gift of part of the monastery where Luther worked. And it was expected that they would move out in time and by the 
by a proper house. Well, not for Katie. This was, this was her home. And she was going to make it so. And what she did was to, to transform the place into what today would be called a conference center. She had students there. She used to uh, brew beer and do all sorts of things. And uh, she even, uh, with, with Luther, uh, I think, changed the chapel into a bowling alley. I mean, you know, that was how they did things. They liked temping bowling. Now, because of the liberating power of the gospel, which was all of grace alone, centered on Christ alone, received by faith alone, life could be enjoyed as it was meant to be enjoyed, as a gift from God. Luther said, No one knows how it hurts a young man to avoid happiness and to cultivate solitude and melancholy. I, who have spent my life mourning, now seek and accept joy wherever I would find it. Now that is what real inner peace with God through simply trusting in the promise of God through Jesus Christ brings. But it was in having children that they found completion to the gift of married life. The Luthers had six children in all, and they took in four orphan children. That's one big family. One child died near birth. Another, Magdalene, died at the age of 13. And it was this death which pretty well broke both of their hearts. Magdalene was Luther's favorite, and her death almost drove him to despair. And that's where he would have ended had it not been for the gospel. As she lay dying, Luther, weeping at her bedside, asked her, Magdalene, my dear little daughter, would you like to stay here with your father? Or would you be willing to go yonder to your heavenly father? Magdalene answered, Darling Father, as God wills. Luther wept and holding her in his arms, he prayed that God would free her. And she died. At the funeral service, which Luther himself conducted with his daughter laid out in the coffin, he declared, Darling Lena, you will rise and shine like a star, yea, like the sun. I am happy in spirit, but the flesh is sorrowful and weak and will not be content. The parting grieves me beyond measure. I have sent a saint to heaven. No doubt, no purgatory, just a quiet assurance that God is as good as his word. The righteous shall live by faith. Well, Luther never fully recovered from his daughter's death. The burden of leading a reformation eventually began to take its toll. And in January 1546, Luther wrote these words to a friend. Listen to this. I, who am old, lazy, worn out, Cold, chilly, with only one eye to see with, now write to you. I will give myself as a kind of Christ to my neighbor, as Christ gave himself for me. He then prayed these words. O oh, Heavenly Father, God of all comfort. I thank you that you have revealed yourself to me, your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, in whom I have believed, whom I have preached and confessed, whom I have loved and praised. I pray, dear Lord Christ, let me commend my soul to you. O oh, Heavenly Father, if I leave this body and depart this life, I am certain that I will be with you forever and that I can never, never tear myself out of your hands. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And having repeated that Bible verse three times, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. You have redeemed me, the true God. Amen. By February, he'd gone to be with his Lord. Now, maybe that you're here this morning, and while you say you're a follower of Jesus, maybe having given your life to him at some dateable point, you are, in fact, not living the life of faith. You see, a peculiar error into which we can all naturally fall is in thinking that faith is the entry point into the Christian life. Trusting in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I did that at Billy Graham rally in 1956 or whenever it may be. But then you lapse into thinking that it is my works which keep me there with the result that our lives are robbed of the joy God wishes to give us, the joy of himself. So we become introspective. We wonder whether we're praying enough, or giving enough, or serving enough, or evangelizing enough, with a sneaking suspicion that if we aren't, and chances are we're not, then God's love is going to wane, it's going to cool. Or maybe, as Christians, we lapse into sin. Having a sinful habit, we find very hard to break, and so we feel we've got to summon up enough strength to overcome this, and then God will be pleased with us. But surely that can't be right. Luther's first thesis of those 95 he nailed to that door was that the whole of life is one of repentance. Repentance. That we recognize that in ourselves we are unrighteous. And so moment by moment, joyfully relying on Jesus and his sacrifice for our sins, for our peace. We never move from the cross in that sense. We don't just begin there, we remain there. And when my heart condemns me, and it does often, Jesus is the one who acquits me. It's by going back to the cross and resting in God's promises that we are assured of God's love and we have our lives changed into joy. So let me end with one final word from Luther. We may look into his fatherly heart and sense how boundlessly he loves us. That would warm our hearts, setting them aglow with thankfulness. And friends, that's what it means that we are saved by faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. Shall we pray? few moments of quiet as we bring before this gracious God our own thoughts and our own prayers as we think of what he has given and continues to give through the boundless and limited love of his beloved son. Oh, dear Lord, we pray we would never move away from the cross. Lord, there we see your righteousness displayed so wonderfully in removing our sin and in saving us. We thank you, Lord, that there is a great heaven to be gained and a hell to be avoided. And this is possible now because of what your Son has done for us. O Lord, we pray that you lift our hearts to you 
in true adoration and genuine gratitude that we would not treat you so lightly as we so often do, but, Lord, would rest and find comfort in that love which is vaster than any ocean. And as the supply comes to us by faith day by day, for these things we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen.